Marie Bell was born on May 26, 1957. She grew up in an inner suburb of Newcastle upon Tyne, raised by Elizabeth Bell, a prostitute who never wanted kids. At her best, she was neglectful, leaving her daughter with her father in order to work in Glasgow. Billy Bell was a violent alcoholic and petty criminal. It is little surprise then that in the hateful and disturbed environment that was her household, she failed to develop emotional attachments to people. More surprising, however, is what would happen next. Within minutes of her birth, her mother was screaming at the nurses for attempting to give her her own daughter, shouting, Take the thing away from me! Growing up, Mary suffered many injuries and accidents, only when alone with her mother. Once, she dropped her daughter from a first floor window, and another time she overdosed her daughter on sleeping pills. Her family suspected she was trying to kill Mary. At one point, she even sold her to an unstable lady, even though she refused offers from her family to adopt Mary multiple times. It wasn't about her, it was about the money. And she finally found a way to make a quick buck. When Mary was sold off, a family member had to track her down and return her. Elizabeth found another way to leverage her daughter soon after as she began allowing her clients to sexually abuse her daughter in sadomasochistic sessions as early as the mid-1960s. Mary had sudden mood swings and was a classroom bully. She tried to strangle several of her classmates. She once tried to kill a girl with sand. Kids in school figured out Mary's tics and could predict when she was about to explode. Her head would start shaking, and she'd stare down her target with her piercing blue eyes. While most of the kids avoided Mary, she spent lots of time with Norma Bell, a 13-year-old who lived next door. Despite being older than Mary, she followed her, and would often get in trouble as a result. For example, a 3-year-old was found bleeding from his head and wandering around in a daze. He told the police he was playing with Mary and Norma on a seven-foot-tall abandoned air raid shelter. He didn't know which one pushed him off to the ground. That same day, Mary and Norma tried to strangle three small girls while playing in a sand pit. The mothers of the girls called the police. They showed up and interviewed the duo about both instances. Mary and Norma both denied pushing the boy off the air raid shelter, claiming they found the boy after he fell. When asked about the three girls, Norma admitted Mary tried to throttle each of the girls beforehand, asking, What happens if you choke someone? Do they die? Police informed the local authority, and both girls were only given a warning due to their age. It was the day before Mary's 11th birthday when a four-year-old named Martin Brown was found upstairs by three kids in a bedroom of a doomed house. He was lying on his back with his arms stretched above his head. He had specks of blood and foam around his mouth, but no signs of violence. John Hall showed up and tried to perform CPR, but it was too late. Mary and Norma showed up at the doorway to the bedroom and were shooed off. They went to Martin's aunt and told her what happened. Soon after, Mary and Norma broke into and vandalized a nursery. They tore up books, overturned desks, and smeared ink and paint on everything. Staff found out about this the day after and called the police. They also found four notes claiming responsibility for Martin's death. The police assumed this was a prank. Just before Martin's funeral, the duo called his mother's house asking to see her son. She told them they couldn't. He's dead. 
they said they knew. They wanted to see him in his coffin. July 31st, 1968. Mary and Norma were playing with three-year-old Brian Howe outside his house. The last time his parents saw him alive. People began looking for him sometime in the afternoon, but it wasn't until 11 o'clock p.m. when a search party found his body between two large concrete blocks. A cop noticed that they tried to hide the body with clumps of grass and weeds. His lips were blue, and he had several scratches and bruises on his neck. There was a pair of broken scissors near his feet. The coroner concluded that Brian died from strangulation and was dead for up to seven and a half hours before being found. The killer squeezed his nostrils shut with one hand and grabbed his neck with the other. His hair was cut and there were puncture wounds on his legs. The killer partially mutilated his genitals and carved the letter M into the victim's stomach. There were also gray and maroon fibers found in Brian's clothes and shoes. They didn't match any clothes in his house and were left by the murderer. The low force used to kill him showed the murderer was likely another child. Over 100 detectives were called in and over 1,200 children were questioned for alibis, including Mary and Norma. The detectives knew they were the last ones seen with Brian. Norma was excitable. Mary was more observant and intelligent. They said they were with Brian that day and they didn't see him after lunchtime. The interrogation of the two continued the day after, during which Mary said she saw a specific boy playing with Brian. Allegedly, he was hitting the child who had a small pair of scissors with him. Detective Chief Inspector James Dobson was convinced that Mary was the killer, since the scissors weren't public knowledge, and the boy in question was at Newcastle International Airport that day. Oops. On the 4th of August, Norma's parents contacted the cops, saying their daughter would like to talk about Brian's murder. Dobson went to their home personally. He told her her rights and asked her what she knew. She told him Mary took her to show her Brian's body and that Mary showed her how she strangled the kid. Allegedly, Mary enjoyed killing him and scoured his stomach with the razor blade and the broken scissors. Norma took the police to the crime scene and showed them the blade and her drawings of the injuries matched what the coroner described. On August 5th, the police visited Mary Bell. When questioned about inconsistencies, she accused them of trying to brainwash her. Later that day, the police questioned Norma again. She admitted to being there when the strangulation happened. She claimed that the three of them went to play when she saw Mary's pre-violence tics and then she pushed the kid into the grass and started to strangle him. In the story, Mary then said, My hands are getting thick. Take over. And Norma ran away. The girl's clothes matched the fibers found on Brian and the gray ones matched those found on Martin. Mary Bell was watching as the coffin was brought out and was laughing and rubbing her hands at the beginning of the funeral. Dobson saw and realized if he didn't bring her in, she'd kill again. Mary and Norma turned on each other the second legal proceedings began, both of them pointing the finger at each other the entire time. They were psychologically evaluated, and Norma was found to be intellectually delayed, submissive, and emotional. Mary was found to be sharp and cunning, had sudden mood swings, and was only occasionally willing to talk. She also was described as having a psychopathic personality disorder. Mary relied on primitive manipulation, ingratiating herself to people, bullying, violence, and complaining. Lots of complaining. 
The official trial for the murders of Martin Brown and Brian Howe started at Newcastle Assizes on December 5, 1968. The judge waived the defendant's right to anonymity due to their age, and the media was able to publicize everything. The trial lasted nine days and saw Mary convicted of two counts of manslaughter because of diminished responsibility. Norma was acquitted of all charges. Hearing their verdicts, Norma clapped her hands in excitement, and Mary burst into tears. She was sentenced at Her Majesty's pleasure. Bouncing around a bit, she was transferred to the Red Bank Secure Unit. She was the only girl among 24 inmates, and allegedly she was raped by one of the staff and several inmates. She was transferred at 16 and eventually into Moore Court Open Prison, where she briefly escaped. She stayed with a young man in Blackpool for a few days and went sightseeing. Mary dyed her hair blonde and attempted disguise. She was arrested soon after. She was released from prison in May of 1980 at age 23. She was given anonymity and a new name, so she could restart somewhere else and live a normal life. Four years later, she gave birth to a daughter. In 1998, reporters figured out where Mary was living, and they were forced to move to a safe house. She fought several legal battles to get lifetime anonymity for her, as well as her daughter and her granddaughter. We don't know how her story ends, but by all appearances, it seems like she grew out of her horrific violence and came out a better person. Only time will tell. <laughs>